Thank you everyone for joining us at Blockchain Tech Fest for this you know, panel discussion on the topic of emerging themes in blockchain, ESG, tokenization, and metaverse. I have, you know, I am Vikram Sharma, you know, moderator for this panel discussion. And in my professional life, I lead, you know, blockchain practice at HCL. And I'm also, you know, a senior blockchain architect. I've been in industry for about more than 15 years now and, you know, with blockchain for about five years. And, you know, I have a passion to use technology to solve business problems and have been, you know, providing solution architecture design and technology roadmap for customer globally. I like to say connected with the community and uh, by way, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, part of Hyperledger India chapter, you know, uh, so I lead event organizations and, you know, uh, support that, you know, uh, the community with, you know, meetup organizations as well. So I have with me, you know, four of the esteemed panelists, you know, best in the industry that we could have, right? Each of them has, you know, such strong credentials that, you know, it would have taken, you know, me a complete hour if, you know, if, if I were to do, do them justice, right? So please excuse me for that. And uh, I'll just introduce them and then probably, you know, uh, they can, you know, uh, introduce them themselves, you know, I suppose, you know, I, I'll definitely miss out on some of the, those details. So I have with me starting with uh, Professor Sandeep Shukla. So Sandeep is, you know, uh, IEEE fellow and ACM distinguished scientist. He is currently professor of computer science and engineering at IIT Kanpur, which he had it, you know, during 2017 to 2020. Before joining IIT Kanpur, you know, he was, you know, a professor at Virginia Tech USA, and he is currently associate directors of ACM uh, transactions on cyber physical systems and general of British Blockchain Association. Welcome, uh, <clears throat> Professor Sandeep. So, uh, but did, uh, so if you want to say a couple of words and then I'll introduce the other panelists. If you yeah, want thank to. You. Thank you for inviting me to the panel and uh, thank you for the introduction. I am um, uh, running the National Blockchain Project funded by the uh, National Cybersecurity Coordinators Office since 2018. And we have been, we have developed a number of uh, solutions uh, which are actually deployed like uh, the land registry uh, on blockchain in uh, Karnataka, an e-procurement solution in Karnataka. We also have a self-sovereign identity blockchain, uh, which is used for uh, giving credentials, verifiable credentials. Uh, and mostly it currently it is being used for providing degrees of IIT Kanpur, IIT Indore, um, IGNU, AKTU. Uh, and uh, yesterday, the police uh, academy uh, uh, and RRU. Uh, so we have been using Hyperledger through and through. So uh, I'm a Hyperledger uh, person. Uh, that's it. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor Sandeep. So next we have with us uh, Naresh Jain. He is co-founder at Snapper Future Tech. With more than three decades of industry experience, with more than two decades of management and IT consulting. So Naresh is also a proud entrepreneur and investor in blockchain technology. And he has, you know, multi-domain expertise and various accolades and certifications to his name. So welcome, Naresh. A uh, couple of words from you. Thank you, Vikram. And uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, as a panelist. Uh, uh, I'll be glad to share my what of knowledge I have gathered in the last five and a half years. So currently, uh, as a company, we are really doing a lot of uh, innovative work. We are a uh, uh, Hyperledger certi Certified Service Provider. And uh, as such, uh, uh, we are working on multiple uh, uh, blockchain framework, but it's uh, all across industry, uh, different kind of use cases and products and uh, training, all of that. Thank you. Yes, welcome, Anarish. And then next we have with us Prasanna Loha. So he is CEO at Blockstack and is practicing blockchain research, digital transformation, and innovation implementation. So he has a vision to make India a hub for blockchain and Web 3.0. He is also director at Association of Emerging Technologies in India, and previously he was also CIO for DCB Bank. Welcome, Prasanna, to the conversation. A couple of words from you. Uh, you're on yeah, thank you, Vikram, and uh, great to be here among uh, all the mentors of blockchain, Mr. Naresh, uh, Sandeep sir, uh, Deepak. So let's move forward how this discussion is going to help you for our all of our uh, friends who are listening us. So thank you so much, uh, Hyperledger India, for inviting me and uh, all of our colleagues out here. So as you already introduced me, so thank you once again, and I look forward for uh, engaging this session with all of our mentors. 
Yes, welcome, Prasanna. And next, we have, you know, uh, fourth panelist, last but not the least. So, Deepak Gharge. So, he is co-founder at Stealth Blockchain Startup and co-founder at Master Mentors Advisory, you know, Private Limited, a blockchain consulting and development company uh, in partnership with Natsop. He comes with 25 years of experience across industries, his passion for blockchain and its potential to change the, uh, the business environment led him to, you know, blockchain ecosystem. I'll let him introduce himself and, you know, uh, on the points that I might have missed. Thanks, Vikram. Thanks for uh, inviting for this panel discussion. It's a great opportunity. I've been working uh, and discussing a lot of use cases along with my mentor and uh, panelist, Prasanna Lohar. We've been sharing a lot of uh, knowledge across platforms, across use cases. And this is a fantastic platform to discuss uh, the used cases where we are talking about CBTC, Web3 and Metaverse. As these are growing technologies and these are going to shape the business models and enterprise uh, to scale up. And it is also putting India in a different league of players on the global <laughs> ecosystem, especially the CBDC uh, initiative where the government has started uh, with RBI has already started the pilot. I think we are seeing going to see an incredible growth in terms of uh, uh, CBDC implementation as well as G20 presidency where we are currently hosting the G20 uh, 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 people who are based on uh, India now. And there are some good news which are coming through. Hopefully by end of this presidency, we will achieve a lot. And thanks a lot for that. Yes, welcome Deepak. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, you know, in interest of time, I'll, you know, I would, you know, get started with our, you know, discussion. So the theme for today is emerging themes in blockchain, ESG, tokenization, and metaverse. So to start with ESG, so I would, you know, so I see that, you know, many of the, you know, my industry leaders and everyone is talking about ESG, right? And uh, so on observing, you know, uh, the blockchain happenings in business, so uh, sustainability has become, you know, a center point and sort of center focus for everyone. And I think, you know, uh, in coming years, we are going to see, you know, a lot when it comes to, you know, sustainability. So it is actually a good thing in that, you know, the focus is coming over there. So I want to hear your views, uh, Professor Sandeep, that how do you believe that, you know, ESG is going to, uh, that focus on ESG is going to, uh, you know, uh, build us for the future and how blockchain can help us. Yeah, so uh, sustainability and environment is becoming uh, more important every day because of global warming and, and uh, population explosion and so on. And there are certain things that various governments are bringing on. For example, carbon credit, they're talking about uh, water saving. Uh, they're talking about, uh, you know, various kinds of uh, credits for, uh, for doing sustainable uh, practices and, uh, and environmental friendly industrial practices. So a few, few months ago, I was talking to a company that does uh, sensors for uh, water systems uh, in the industry. And they have IoT based sensors through which they actually meter the amount of water uh, they actually use and, and save. And they actually were talking about using those IOTs to uh, actually uh, give, create a credit system uh, for water saving practices uh, over a blockchain. Uh, the reason why use, uh, why they wanted to use blockchain is because right now it's uh, currently a, it is self-reporting system. Now the self-reporting system may or may not be you know trustworthy, and therefore uh, if the IOT uh, devices can directly uh, put the, the data on the blockchain and that data can be actually then used uh, for analytics, then one can actually, uh, the government as well as public in general can actually have a view on how the water uh, sustainable practices of uh, water usage, uh, especially industries that are very intensive in water usage can do that. Similarly, uh, I know a number of companies that are using carbon credit system on blockchain. Uh, so I, I see that uh, there is a movement for this environmental and sustainability practices to be transparent to common people and the government uh, so that the regulations are complied with as well as 
the reputation of the organizations can be actually put out to public in a very trustworthy manner. So I think there is a lot of scope uh, of blockchain in this space. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, movement in that direction. And I think more movements will come. So I think this is one of the good practices of blockchain, uh, you know, um, that I, I particularly feel very uh, good about. Yes, so by, uh, I, you know, I couldn't agree more by, on, the, you know, that self-reporting will continue to pose challenges and, you know, so IoT based, you know, reporting is important and uh, use of blockchain for transparency is also, you know, uh, very, you know, important in my, at least in my view. And, you know, if I leave the, you know, the continent of Antarctica, I think in rest, all of the, you know, continents I've been having, you know, conversations with customers or, you know, uh, work, you know, working on, you know, e you know, mass sustainability and ESG, you know, methods. So what is, what are your, you know, thoughts, uh, when it, uh, Naresh, that, you know, should, you know, we look at, you know, IoT and blockchain or IoT or blockchain is also an option. Uh, all right. Uh, first of all, uh, let me start by saying uh, IoT and uh, uh, blockchain definitely both are going to play a big, big role. Uh, no doubt about that. And uh, there, because uh, the major challenge what we are facing today or we are going to face, and because it just started, we are targeting 2050 for uh, 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 net zero carbon. For that, uh, uh, for, for decades, for centuries, in fact, uh, in India, we have been collecting waste, right? And uh, that process of recycling, it's already there. there. In global uh, uh, level, that process uh, recently started. So major challenge what we are facing today is that we are not able to track. So whatever recycling we are doing, even though uh, we are producing less carbons and we are saving it, we are not able to produce a, show, a showcase. And over there, it becomes very, very important that how do we prove that what has been recycled or how much carbon saving we have done? And for that, of course, uh, one of the ways is uh, using sensors when we are doing waste management, like waste collection when we do at different places uh, from where we have uh, collected how much, what kind of waste and uh, how different companies are, uh, different companies or uh, uh, different people are managing that. So complete traceability. And that is where the biggest gap is as on today that uh, without having a proper traceability, it'll become a problem to prove to the world that we are carbon becoming carbon neutral. And for that, blockchain plays is plays a big role and, and will play a big role. For example, if we talk about, uh, say, plastic recycling or battery recycling or e-waste, uh, e over there, currently, uh, EPR certificates are produced extended producer responsibility APR certificate uh, are produced mainly by the recyclers. And uh, there are a lot of frauds happen because the whole market, first of all, it's a, uh, it's informal sector uh, over there. Uh, it's all a lot of uh, manual paperwork and compliances are heavy because of that, uh, uh, there are challenges. And uh, if we are able to bring a solution or system, where we can do starting from waste collection till uh, creating a EPR certificate and complete uh, traceability of that. And even after that, when, do, when we do recycling, whatever products we are putting, uh, manufacturing out of that, uh, the consumer or the end customer should be able to trace back saying that what kind of products has been, uh, waste has been recycling that, where from where it has come. Uh, from compliance point of view, traceability point of view, uh, bringing informal, uh, uh, everybody in a formal sector and ultimately reducing frauds. That is the need of the hour and blockchain can play a big role in that. Yes, uh, some excellent views and especially, you know, you talked about traceability and compliance. So uh, if I talk about, you know, standardization, uh, because, you know, if I look at, you know, ESG scores, there are so many, you know, uh, different standards of how you report data and what you report that data into, how do you calculate your ESG score? That has also been, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, people have been talking about that, you know, there is no standardization across, right? Different uh, entities or different organizations are reporting using different schema or different, you know, uh, method of calculation. 
so my question to you prasanna is uh, how do you believe that you know uh, we should be you know uh, working towards it that you know uh, with so many different standards uh, you know accepted it across you know uh, different geographies or you know places uh, you are on mute prasanna yeah i think uh, uh, yeah am i audible yes yeah i think a very very good question uh, uh, and uh, nothing works without right standards uh, it all research and uh, uh, aspiration towards much more uh, innovations uh, imagine we have a, a very good standard around uh, security we have a very, very good standard around uh, data transformation uh, on the internet uh, likewise esg is a global agenda now it has not remained a particular organization uh, relevant agenda where governments are involved uh, public bodies are involved and the whole aspiration today may not be that uh, uh intent but by the time we reach 2025 or 2030 the need of a uh, uh, meeting sdg guidelines as well as the esg uh, pointers is going to be very very critical and important today there are some business model where uh, countries and uns and uh, uh, various government associations even g20 it was being discussed are uh, are driving it and there are a lot of tech companies and startups are coming up with some kind of innovation which is being adopted by bodies of uh, 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 industry is example in Maharashtra. Uh, we had uh, this water resource group who has come up with some guidelines for all the hotel industry to use the recycled water. Now, although this guideline is there, how do you really go and uh, measure and calibrate whether the particular hotel is utilizing the recycled water in the uh, measured capacity at a 10 o'clock today? So, how do we bring on uh, that stuff where technology can come play into role? Where Narendra spoke about. Uh, how do you have a accuracy of a data capturing and actual accuracy reporting out there to the government so that a government whenever want to audit and see against the, the particular esg guidelines whether the things are really going ahead adequately or not i think those kind of a stuff where we can really practice it now but as far as the standards and the procedure are concerned it is i think it is a long way there has to be a lot of efforts has to be taken uh, in that uh, in that context certainly as of now much uh, much things are being explored there are a lot of uh, exchanges are coming like carbon credit exchanges and so on but as a standard i think we have to really work closely with uh, uh, all the other governments and i think this should be this should become a right agenda ahead of uh, uh, adoption of uh, many other areas so i think in a nutshell we have to uh, reach to that milestone to have a right set of processes and standards but lot of huge efforts are being taken by governments uh, relevant corporates uh, and uh, startups or uh, tech companies also participating what we have seen uh, two years before and today uh, many corporates are now coming and imparting lot of a uh, contribution to the esg uh, implementation so it's i think we need to be part of this and create a right set of uh, standards and the processes so that it becomes win win situation rather than a ultimate guideline for a corporate to uh, to have this whole particular practice the way we have uh, various departments so now as of now this responsibility is being taken care either by some of the csr uh, groups within a corporates or marketing guys to bring on but i think esg becomes agenda for every corporates in a nutshell every government out there state or central uh, we need to have a, a, a standardization now within india they, there are some standards there are some bodies who are coming up with some kind of uh, standards but the way we have a global standard is we have to reach uh, uh, that junction but i think it's a continuous journey we need to at least put more investment more innovation more research around these areas to bring what is that needed for the next step yeah Yes. Uh, yeah. So we lost your video, Prasanna, uh, for some time. But yes, you were audible. And uh, so essentially, what you're uh, so, if I gather your thoughts, so you are saying that you know, uh, you know uh, that there has to be a structure put in place with uh, different, uh, you know, with the government bodies. So and uh, I suppose you know uh, there could also be there would also be some role of you know how has been some role of you know uh, how people have been you know bar investors have been talking about or you know investing into you know bar uh, only when you know in the business is sustainable and not just sustainable from the you know bar sustainable eco and you know eco uh, friendly for ecosystem as well right so yeah so with that in mind you know uh, deepak my question to you would be 
that uh, do you believe it it has to be a global effort or you know uh, like uh, when it comes to carbon you know uh, like emissions tracking or you know like uh, something at the you know level of united nations or something like that or it has to be you know regional efforts you know to uh, bring up you know those standards and you know do that tracking and uh, for, or, and what would be the role of you know individuals in there or investors into it See, today, uh, good question. Uh, see, today the climate, the impact on climate and the uh, impact on uh, soaring uh, temperatures. Today morning itself, I posted on LinkedIn. Mumbai was never 35 degrees in winters. This is an impact of climate change, probably one of the reasons, right? And uh, every other city is around 20, 22 degrees. Mumbai today, in the last week, it's soaring around 34 to 37 degrees which is not quite uh, obvious, uh, which is which is a deviation actually. And uh, this is a global problem and it has to be addressed at a global level where Prasanna also spoke about the standardization where it will eventually evolve. But at a regional level, you do not have to wait for things to happen at a global level. Today, we are talking about G20 presidency. We are talking about debt, cryptocurrency and climate as one of the hot topics where the G20 presidency uh, uh, people are discussing to close this, uh, come to a conclusion by end of this uh, 2023. And uh, there as a uh, country, if you want to take the position or a leader as a presidency, you need to have a foolproof system to eradicate or reduce the uh, emission, carbon emission of the waste management product. See, in the Western world, uh, probably I think uh, Sweden or Norway, where they have uh, specific areas where you can uh, put your e-wastes, uh, where you can dump your e-waste, it will go directly to the e-waste collector. So if you are keeping any loopholes in the system, then you will always uh, allow things to uh, uh, crop up and then it will create a new problem. Rather like if we have, if I have to dispose my mobile or a laptop or something, I need to have a foolproof mechanism that my laptop or a, a mobile has been uh, sent to a, a registered e-waste company, either it is refurbished or it is uh, uh, it is made carbon neutral. For industries also, it has to be tracked at such a level where the auditor, the regulator, the auditor and the owners of that carbon uh, uh, emitter, they need to know what is happening at that level. And uh, till we uh, bring a foolproof system, uh, or we innovate a foolproof system and bring our own standards for each industry because each industry has its own emission limits and it has got its own uh, processes as well. So we need to define that and then bring a standards for each industry and start with where we have quick wins so that we can replicate this as a uh, and scale it up to other industries. Yeah, so uh, the, you know, views, I think are, you know, we are all in consensus. So uh, we all, you know, are linked to blockchain in some way. And, you know, I suppose we all reached a consensus that, you know, steps are being taken, but, you know, more needs to be done and uh, structure needs to be put in place and uh, traceability and compliance should be there. IoT should be there so that, you know, uh, we are not relying on, you know, whatever, you know, someone self reports. And uh, we only trust the technology, right? So trust uh, more into technology than into, you know. Uh, technology uh, alone will not help Vikram. See, there has to be huge penalties. <clears throat> so otherwise people will not yeah. adhere to the, uh, uh, the compliances, right? See, today we have, uh, uh, we break rules on the road. Most of us do it uh, by knowing or unknowingly, but there is no heavy penalty. The moment you put penalty, everything will get... Uh, normalized. Yes, sir. so let me add one, one of the example as uh, Deepak is talking about penalty. In India, currently, every year, battery manufacturers or the companies who are dealing in battery, they are paying a penalty of more than $6 million every year as on today. Uh, that is just a penalty cost because they are not compliant or some kind of issues are there. Uh, and that is happening. Why that is happening? It's only because they are not able to track the whole thing. So there's a big gap in terms of uh, 
from where the battery has come and how it has been recycled and uh, what kind of process has been followed. Uh, so till the time we don't have such kind of solutions. And in fact, uh, the process has already started. In fact, uh, we, we as a company also are involved in that. Uh, we're working on that solution, but uh, uh, it requires a big push from the government also. Not only you have to be compliant and putting a penalty in place, supporting companies in uh, uh, creating or developing solutions to fulfill that requirement. That's what is very, very important, uh, I feel. Also, just adding one more point. Uh, today, where people are becoming uh, directors or independent directors of startups and uh, on company boards, mm -hmm. uh, there is also a, a certification on ESG. So uh, while uh, people are identifying the boards or independent directors, they should have somebody who's qualified uh, independent director or director with an ESG certification so that they can guide them on this uh, uh, ESG standards and how to, to uh, uh, how to follow these compliances and processes. Yep. Uh, so some excellent thoughts. So I think uh, uh, you know we can spend you know a good amount of time on this uh, you know topic and you know there would be you know so many inputs that I think we all have. Uh, so but I'll you know try to move on to the next topic uh, that we have is tokenization. And when I say tokenization, you know, all the, you know, lights, you know, uh, all the bulbs, you know, start, blo you know, blowing when, because of the NFTs, right? So most people are relating, you know, uh, tokenization with NFTs because that's how, you know, it has been commercialized, right? So that, that one part is there. And, you know, many of the, them are buying uh, NFTs for the sake of buying it. And also, uh, but yes, uh, so it does give us, you know, good repo blockchain, you know, at least it familiarizes people with blockchain and, but it does set some, you know, expectations as well. And when something goes wrong with crypto, you know, blockchain also takes the, you know, blame as well, right? So I want with that, you know, uh, Professor Sandeep, you know, my question to you is that uh, we have, you know, uh, UPI, we have digital rupee. So how do you believe that, you know, our digital rupee is, uh, will add value and uh, what is the role that blockchain is going to play in CB, in, um, uh, in central bank digital currency? For, uh... Right. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, the UPI is a payment method and uh, CBDC is a currency, right? So, so there is a difference. So also in UPI, you have to have settlement in banks. You have to go through your central bank, your receiver <clears throat> bank, you have to settle. Whereas in CBDC, the settlement is real time and without the intermediary, right? So, so CBDC is kind of a tokenization of the uh, money, which is uh, cryptographically secured and which uh, can be uh, transferred from wallet to wallet uh, without an intermediary like cash. And uh, therefore, uh, and so also CBDC has these other uh, advantages. Uh, for example, the CBDC being a token, uh, a smart contract can actually uh, be used to program it. Uh, it can be uh, used for uh, welfare uh, by actually making sure that the CBDC uh, uh, push to the wallets to welfare would be only usable for food and clothing and things like that and not for uh, anything uh, liquor, for example, you can actually also uh, 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 use monetary policy uh, for CBDC. Uh, for example, you can decide to give uh, interest uh, on CBDC uh, stored in wallets uh, if you want to control some, uh, you know, some uh, put some monetary uh, levers. Uh, you can also uh, expire the money, like. Uh, uh, if 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 if, if uh, uh, that situation arises uh, in terms of this thing, uh, uh, also uh, CBDC hopefully will be actually uh, provide anonymity uh, to the extent uh, that the laws in India or or, or the country of jurisdiction uh, allows anonymous uh, transactions of cash, for example. Uh, but uh, uh, beyond a certain limit, cash is also cannot be legally uh, anonymous, anonymously transferred. So same thing would happen to CBDC, but the anonymity would be built in through technology and through legal backings. So UPI cannot be anonymous, for example, uh, 
uh, UPI is uh, le le leaving too many digital trails. Uh, UPI cannot be programmed uh, or purposed. Uh, so UPI is, a, is a basically a payment method, uh, but you are paying by your uh, bank money, whereas uh, CBDC is a central bank uh, money that is uh, provided to you by, uh, by, a, by via a bank but it is it is redeemable uh, by the fiat of the central bank so it's a it's a very different uh, uh, system so by yep so exactly you know, uh, i i think it can't be you know put better and you know explained you know so, so simply and elegantly so so uh, what are your views on you know the wallets you know would people need to use wallets for you know uh, leveraging the central bank digital currency uh, wallets, of course, uh, uh, are required. Uh, the wallets have to have some built-in features uh, that that uh, because uh, CBDC another uh, another aspect that CBDC has to be has to be has to have is that uh, I should be able to pay offline. That is, if I, in India, for example, there are a lot of internet denied environment. Uh, therefore, uh, there are uh, requirements for offline payments. It may be within a limit because the risk, there is always a risk uh, with offline payment. Uh, although um, most probably the wallet has to uh, bootstrap on the uh, on the uh, TE or trusted execution environment in the, in the phones, uh, which uh, has some risk, uh, probably low risk, but there is a risk uh, for, for TEs to be hacked. But uh, the, the offline payment would be very important. And therefore, wallets are required. Then this designing these wallets to be secure, uh, double spend proof, and uh, secured from tampering and secure for, from uh, creation of uh, fake currency, et cetera, are going to be very important. But wallets will be required, yes. OK. So uh, my question to Naresh then, uh, inclusivity is, you know, uh, is quite important when it comes to central bank digital currency, right? Especially, you know, when uh, about what uh, more than 100 countries are right now, you know, working on the uh, on such projects, right, including India. So what are your thoughts of inclusivity and how CBDC promotes it? Yeah, so as uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Sandeep just mentioned uh, uh, in the last uh, there's one option which is going to be available that uh, we can do a CBDC or we can use CBDC or uh, digital rupee even without uh, internet uh, in offline mode, right? What it means, that is going to be a fundamental for inclusivity of uh, going to far-fest uh, places all over, uh, all over India where each and every user would be able to use uh, a wallet and do a transaction using uh, his mobile, right? Of course, uh, be a 5G, uh, which is uh, which has come up now, as it goes all over the places, uh, that is going to definitely add a lot of value uh, because that's what is needed uh, for the overall thing. Uh, but uh, this is uh, going to simplify things. Over here, uh, people who are living in far uh, far places uh, they don't have to really go to the bank and uh, they don't have to really uh, go through a complicated process of opening the account and all that it's just a simple wallet like it's your uh, cash wallet uh, which is in your pocket it's it's going to work exactly like that it is as simple uh, as that once you have money in your in your wallet you keep on using it you keep on getting, you keep on, uh, keep on uh, transferring it. And that is going to help uh, inclusivity. Okay. Uh, one, one point I want to make quickly is that there is a catch there that for a wallet to be able to, uh, to be allowed to do offline transfer, it has to be the, the mobile has to have a trusted execution environment. And in India, there are people who are still using Android 3 and Android 4 phones. So, so there is a possibility that there would be a lot of uh, people who would not have a trusted execution environment enabled phone, which case <laughs> the inclusivity will not work. So, so we have to be uh, figure out how to uh, solve that problem. 
Yeah, yes, yes you're right. Uh, uh, there are going to be a lot of challenges. Yes, uh, mm. you're right. Yeah, so infrastructure, uh, that means infrastructure and, you know, how easy it is for, you know, people to acquire that infrastructure is important. So my question over to Prasanna is, you know, but do you believe, you know, uh, there are certain steps that needs to be taken, you know, in that regard to make, you know, that uh, central bank digital currencies available? And should there be a mechanism to actually interoperate, right? So interoperability is another, you know, big theme, right? So I'll just introduce it. So should there be a way to interoperate and have your crypto assets and your central bank digital currency managed in a, you know, uh, in a single interface? Uh, you are on mute uh, for some reason. Prasanna, we can't hear you. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yeah, so I think uh, what I was saying, I think it's a very good question uh, you have uh, spoke about. Uh, but so I think there are lots of things are going to happen as far as a journey of a CBDC is concerned. I think it is just the beginning of uh, something big, which is going to for all of us, right? Uh, CBDC is a currency and it's a digital currency. It speaks a lot about the uh, difference between UPI and uh, CBDC and uh, Sandeep sir has mentioned it's very well. Uh, as far as the infrastructure is concerned, imagine UPI took to build at least uh, six to seven years since we had a very good railroad uh, built by NPCI, so-called IMPS already. And on top of that, we started building UPI. And uh, to begin with, uh, it was a part of RBI's business statement and the uh, actual building has started in uh, 2015 and we launched in 11 and it took to really build a better uh, uh, use cases on uh, UPI with the phone pay, Google pay and coming into, they are giving a lot of attraction uh, for uh, so this is concerned and the overall infrastructure typically it, it has a wallet followed by uh, it has to have a, some centralized ledger system backed by central bank, which is already in uh, many countries. But in between, right, how, how we have to create a decentralization or how we should have a better security aspect. And you spoke a lot about how interoperability we bring on. So I think there are four steps to build any CBTC. How well was monetary policies which we have? So typically India, like a country, we are very strong at monetary policies. So the challenges which faced by any some countries on a monetary policy, we will not suffer. But then next level, whether it is a decentralization or centralization. So moreover, the decision is already taken or uh, we could see that it will be a decentralized mechanism backed by some uh, enterprise blockchain. That's what we look at it. And the way how other countries like China or uh, 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 Cambodia have taken uh, a leap with some of those well-known blockchain platforms. So similarly, we will also build on the story for us. But although our aspirations will be different, our population, the adoption curve, which we are looking at, not for only payment, because UP and the relevant railroads are only for payment. But CBDC today, it will go beyond RBI, where we will see how insurance and wealth also will interact. So I think uh, the scalability is going to be very, very important aspect around uh, uh, at the end of the day, because CBDC is not only for a user experience on the wallet side, which, which is being already solved with the help of a UPI kind of ecosystem on smartphones. But when you talk about a offline uh, on feature phones or uh, some momentum where we, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Deepak just spoke, spoke about financial inclusion. Uh, it's a global financial inclusion agenda. So how my CBDC should talk with the, some other CBDC of other country. So can we not have some interoperability standards, which is going to be very, very important where BIS comes into picture, banking and transfer settlement or uh, notifications or guidelines by IMF keeps on talking. If you are creating CBDC at a country level, always talk to some other country on a, on a monetary standards as well as a technological standards. So I think there are a lot of ways wherein we could see some experiments like Embridge or uh, Project Helvetica where countries like Sweden, Switzerland, or uh, Singapore are taking part and uh, doing that kind of a research uh, around this. But typically today, the if you even if you talk about uh, uh, adoption of a CBDCs in a prominent countries, uh, some 10, 12 countries are live. So it is not more than two to three percent. Or even you talk about a Cambodia adoption is as a uh, download has done it for 50 percent of population, but it to do uh, for an actual adoption. So it's an appeal for RBA also when they are talking about CBDC, 
in the form of a RBI's concept note, it should cover more of a adoption curve also, apart from uh, the learnings which we'll see in a retail CBDC or wholesale CBDC over a period of two to three months, where we will see the scalability or a security part of a learning on a blockchain network. But we need to see how at the end of the day, all reconciliation of all transactions done on today should be nullified at a zero. That is the ultimate um, aim of a CBDC. It's not only to bring a financial inclusion or it's not only to bring some kind of a one wallet for a better customer experience. But at the end of the day, how do we nullify all those operations which we are doing since so many years on current uh, payment ecosystems? Like it takes T plus one or sometimes T plus two and a lot of manual efforts to do that uh, reconciliation settlement, which will be do away with the uh, with the CBDCs. So it's a it's a larger game. I think uh, we keep announcing POCs pilots. It's a good for uh, that larger game, but ultimately it's very, very important how do you have a right infrastructure and interoperable infrastructure which can work from one country to another country and moreover it should onboard not only current payment railroads but eventually uh, the way we have seen uh, insurance was not there right digital insurance or uh, wealth was not there in 90s or 2000 so all of a sudden with digital adoption there are a lot of instruments are coming in our life now UPI, account aggregator, and many more ecosystems are coming, but CBDC coming in, it will open up multiple business models, right? Uh, and so how do you have a uh, appetite for those many transactions when today UPI can handle some thousands of TPS or 5,000 to 20,000 of TPS, this will go over 70, 70,000 TPS in current capacity. Now, what we are building today is, as a CBDC, it should remain at least for the next five to 10 years. So we need to see the cow of adoption of a right platform so right. based on cloud, or uh, we need to see if it is a blockchain also, how it will really take care of a reconciliation part, uh, at, on the same day. So that equation means at least on the day, same day, we are going to reconcile all the India transaction in an Indian context. And it, when it comes to cross border, how do you take care of uh, my CBDC to another CBDC altogether? Uh, uh, but good to see that RBI is uh, very, very keen on top of it. And government of India is also supporting. I can say as a as a humor that we have seen digital uh, or rather demonetization 2016. Can you not see uh, some digital demonetization and say from tomorrow onwards, all paper currency is gone and we are on the verge of only digital. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, uh, but so, uh, I think yeah, yeah, I understand. Games, so, we have seen. Yeah. So I understand that part. Uh, of course, you know, there are so many things to it. So I'll, you know, in, in the interest of time, uh, sorry, Prasada, in the interest of time, I'll move on to Deepak for his remarks on CBDC before, uh, uh, you know, we conclude uh, this session. Uh, so we are, you know, actually, you know, running a bit late. So Deepak, your remarks on, you know, how CBDC uh, can help and or, you know, uh, or if you want to talk about metaverse, right? So that was our, you know, third theme. And, you know, I must see metaverse as a, you know, channel application or extension of existing channels of how you interact with, you know, customers. So, uh, so how do you see metaverse and CBDC playing together? I think that would be, uh, you know, a hello, you know, question to answer. See, I will uh, first finish a couple of points on the CBDC part. I think the uh, esteemed panel has already spoken about infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> like Prasanna said, CBDC, it's a, it's a very early stage. We've still not gone production. It is still in pilot. And there are other countries where uh, they have already moved to production. There is a lot of learning which we are going to carry through these uh, 10, 11 countries. And uh, the, there is a lot of opportunities where the fiat currency was not able to solve. The, fear, the CBDC is going to solve because the traceability of uh, the currency itself is going to solve a lot of uh, <clears throat> problems and uh, there is a lot of NPA issues with the microfinancing and banks and lending ecosystem which can be uh, traced and which can be transparent and it can reduce NPAs. In case of farmers, when the microfinancing is happening, they take the loan for farming but they spend it for reddit. So there are a lot of things which can be controlled and uh, <clears throat> we can build the ecosystem there. Infrastructure, as of, of course, uh, 4G is still not 4G across India. Now we are talking about 5G. By the time 5G matures, probably whole of India gets 4G properly. <laughs> and there are uh, freebies where governments are issuing. Maybe some governments will come and issue smartphones to their uh, elect uh, electoral agenda manifesto. Oh, uh, well, we'll stay away from the we'll stay away from the politics and electoral electoral <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah. 
See, there are uh, CBDC is going to change the game uh, for uh, for the uh, exchange itself, the, uh, for the purpose where fiat currency is being used, and it is going to solve a lot of infrastructure issues as well because since it is digital and it is uh, it's a lot of education needs to happen at the uh, deep roots of the uh, corners of the country but the adoption with post covid has happened faster than any other country i don't see any challenge in india for adoption of uh, digital currency we have been living with multiple currencies in the past history where we had more currencies than any other country itself so i don't see uh, as any roadblock it is going to be a great opportunity for india where india needs to now step up the uh, whole process is to cbdc uh, diplomacy like uh, we had a vaccine diplomacy we need to extend this technology and experience to poor countries and developing countries where you can yes. actually get through the uh, internationalization of the cbdc faster than what we are expecting so that is one right. thing which the government would sharp so on the media part yeah, so it pardon. would be collaboration. It would be, you know, yes. collaboration of, you know, not just us. I think, you know, we need to collaborate and create global standards and global technology to solve these global challenges because these are global challenges, right? So I'm sorry to, you know, cut all of you short. I know that, you know, we had, you know, some time, you know, we wanted to discuss and, you know, there are so many, you know, burning questions, right? And, uh, you know, thank you all for, you know, being here and, you know, giving such wonderful answers and, you know, enlightening us with your thoughts. And uh, it was definitely an intriguing discussion. I, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, that session. So we were live at, you know, three locations, Noida, Bangalore and Trivantapuram, in addition to our virtual audience. So I thank you all for being here and, you know, by, by participating in this, the esteemed panelists and all the all those, uh, you know, uh, members of India chapter and, you know, contributors of India chapter and blockchain enthusiasts who have joined us together. So thank you all. Uh, Arun, Kamlesh, do you have final words or... Well, I think uh, I think we can we can close it and uh, sure. we can continue our. Thank uh, you, everyone. Next step.